I'm going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I feel really grateful, really excited to be here with everyone. I work a, a regular non high desert journal job during the day and I was telling the contributors that I spent most of my day thinking about this zoom event I was just really excited. Um, I am Stacey Bo Miller I'm on the board of high desert journal before I joined the board I was a contributor a couple of years ago I had a couple poems published um, in high desert journal I think issue 31 so i'm really excited to be on this side of of everything. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about tonight and about the journal. High Desert Journal is a voice for the landscape and people of the interior West. Through literature and visual arts, High Desert Journal has created an evolving conversation that deepens and understands the people, places, and issues of the interior West, a region rich in, creative, in creativity, history, and flux, yet often overlooked for its cultural resources. We've been in operation for 17 years. Elizabeth Quinn, who started the journal, is now on the board again, which is really exciting for us. Uh, we invite submissions of poetry, fiction, creative nonfiction, memoirs, interviews, essays, book reviews, letters to the editor, and visual arts. And we are open for submissions now. So if you're here joining us and you would like to contribute some of your work, we feel just absolutely grateful to get to read all the um, amazing words and look at the visual art that you all are working on. Um, I'm so excited to celebrate issue 33. I was thinking about this today and I shared this a little bit with the contributors before we started. Um, but any, any issue of any journal, until you work with a journal, you have no idea how much work goes into it. There's so much work. Um, the amount of, of words that the editors are reading, the creative directors putting in so much time curating it, coding, and all of that represents an enormous amount of hours and collaboration and conversation. But even before those pieces come to us, we know that you contributors have spent maybe a lifetime crafting the pieces or the art that you've trusted us with. And those might represent, I, I'm a poet mostly in my life. And I know that some of my poems represent years and years of work and essays if I ever finish them, sometimes represent even more. And so we just are really grateful to have you trusting us with those years and words and experiences and stories that you've put together. And I just wanna say thank you to our editors, Cheryl Nothi, C. Marie Furman, Laura Pritchett, our creative director, Corey Oglesby, who I think put together one of the most beautiful issues we've had in a long time. Uh, the other board members, Robert Stubble, Stubblefield, Elizabeth Quinn, and a special thank you to Charles Finn, who was our editor-in-chief for 10 years and is just moving on to some other exciting projects. And a huge thank you to our readers, our donors. We feel really, really grateful to be in this literary world with you. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and read people's bios. Go ahead and stay muted until I introduce you, and then... Um, unmute yourself and each person's going to spend about five minutes reading we will end around an hour hour and 15 if people get nervous not knowing what you're committing to that's probably what you're committing to. <laughs> so um, Laura Barthuli lives in Denver Colorado with her husband daughter and a very vocal mutt dog her book reviews have been published in fiction writers review. This is her first fiction publication what an honor for us Laura, thank you so much welcome. Well, thank you. This is this is such an honor for me, and it, it really is such a beautiful issue. Um, I've been reading the journal for quite a while now and hoping to someday place a piece here. So I also want to thank Laura Pritchett, who has given me so many helpful pointers on my stories and, and just advice. And it was really wonderful of her to take the time on, on my earlier work. So um, this is the one that made it. <laughs> um, it's called The Dunes. And I'll just go ahead. I try to keep the twins quiet. Arwen and her husband are sleeping in the other tent and Dan is pretending to sleep in the bag next to me. He must be anyway because the girls whispers are almost louder than their normal talking voices. Finally, I give in, unzipping the tent with a scritch that breaks the early morning. Shush, shush, I murmur as the girls roll onto the hard ground. Let's go to the bathroom. Maybe Dan will get the fire started while we're gone. Fat chance. He's probably already scrolling through the political website he's addicted to. After everyone has peed in the chili stone restroom, we walk down the dirt path toward the river. The girls are practically rabid, running ahead through the scrub. The bushes give way to waves of sand ridged with ice. Our steps crackle on the cold ground. 
Only the very tops of the dunes are lit gold in the sunrise. Look, I tell the girls, the tracks of night creatures. Tiny mouse prints, the heavy, delicate imprint of a rabbit's pads. Their five-year-old selves are only impressed by a long, smooth S in the sand, a trace of snake, snake, fat and dangerous. I'm thinking of Arwen, the way she strolled into camp last night, pristine and twisty, settling on the log next to Dan, leaving her husband to unpack the entire car. She set a bratwurst on fire, blew it out, and ate it burnt raw without a bun. She told Dan half stories of the days they'd spent together in college. He popped a cold beer and let it foam out over his hand, wiping the can on his shirt before he gave it to her. They didn't leave the fire the whole time I spent wrestling the girls into footy pajamas, snuggling them into sleeping bags, and finally, climbing clothed into my own bag when they cajoled, stay mommy, we're scared without you. I listened to the low voices of Arwen and her husband and my husband. I watched the firelight dance on the tent walls and waited for Dan to wonder where I was. When Dan suggested the trip to the sand dunes, I was touched. He was absent these days in his recliner on the porch swing with a beer after work, always phone in hand. Long gone were the weekends exploring the remote corners of the state, the pickup loaded with dogs and gear. Our daughters had never even been camping. Before the girls, we visited the dunes often in every season with groups of friends or just the two of us, hiking through patchy snow along the beginnings of the seasonal creek in early spring, lugging backpacks way into the dunes in late summer, sharing a bottle of tequila and marveling at the stars. It meant something that he thought, finally, to return as a family. Then he tossed out an afterthought once we'd finished packing the cooler. Oh, Arwen and her husband might come. So I knew it had been her idea all along. The one who got away, that's how he must think of her even though they never dated. Arwen the perfect, fleeing to a prestigious MBA program out east after four years at CU, returning with a bland wasp of a husband in tow and a high paying job at a healthcare company downtown. We've come to the wide shallow river of snowmelt that separates the campsites from the dunes. Take off your shoes, I tell the girls. They pile tiny sneakers and socks in a heap and splash barefoot across the freezing water. I leave my weathered hiking sandals on and we all rush to the warmth of the sunny top of the first dune. The girls want to keep going. I peer back now and then, searching for our tent site among the scrub, but I can't pick it out. I'm sweating from the exertion of hiking in sand. Sweat on top of dried sweat, my oily hair shoved under a baseball cap. What a mess I must have looked last night after spending the afternoon setting up camp. Dirt smeared jeans and a ragged flannel. I know what Arwen must think of me, just a housewife, just a mother, covered in muck and blood. I'll never beguile anyone again. I realize we've been climbing up and up. We've scaled the, few, the, few, the first few short dunes, the girls running and sliding, marveling at the seeming unending expanse of sand. The sun has risen all at once, the way it does in Colorado, and it's a sharp fireball alone in the sky. Now we're almost at the top of one of the tall dunes. I look back and admire the shining distant river. I'm proud of the girls, of how far they've been able to walk on their short legs. Despite Arwen's presence, Dan's indifference, maybe this will be a good trip, foster in them a love like mine of the wild desert. One of my daughters screeches, the other wails, and when I turn to them, they're on their bottoms, holding their bare feet up off the sand. Even with the sun bleaching everything white, I can tell their tender feet are bright red. I've forgotten the harshness, the intensity of sun on sand. I have no water, no snacks, no hats or sunscreen. We've walked too far. I remember a movie from elementary school meant to scare us. Two teens joyriding in the desert and their car breaks down. They die out there because they can't remember how to trap water from the air because they don't have enough sense to crawl under the car for some shade. Is this how we'll die? Burnt up on the endless sand? They cry and cry, precious water and salt lost through their tears. I shake off this melodrama. We aren't that far from civilization. Still, I'll have to carry them. I pick up both girls, one in each arm, in despair of the hot hike down the, back down to the camp. But luck, not five feet away, I spot a curve of wood poking from the dune. Setting the girls down to wail and clutch each other, I dig around the wood until I'm able to pry it from the sand. A short board for sand sledding, abandoned or lost. Its black padded seat is faded from the sun, scoured by sand. I pick up one twin and set her on the seat of the sled, then tuck the other twin in front of her sister. Hang on tight, I tell them. They nod with tear-stained faces. I shove the board down the dune. The girls howl but stay on the sled. Once I catch up to them, I hunch over and push the sled to the top of the next dune. I'm drenched in sweat, every muscle screaming. Finally, we reach the top of the last dune. I give one last shove and watch the board take them down, down, down through the shifting sand. The girls hop off the sled, race to the water, splashing and yelling. 
It's so late in the morning, the river is lined with bright umbrellas and towels, day trippers and families from the campground. Bare-legged children run up and down the hard packed sand as if it really is a beach. She can have him if she wants him. Nothing matters except this, I decide as I collapse on the damp sand. I watch my girls, their limbs perfect, skin flawless. As they dance in the shining river, I hope they'll forget the burning sand, remember only clear, cold water. That's the end. <laughs> oh, beautiful. I can't believe that's your first publication <laughs> or your first fiction Thank publication. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my goodness. I hope you keep sending your work out. That was really lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And readers, if you check the chat um, when you're done, most people are sort of singing your praises. So it might be fun for you to read the things people are saying <laughs> about your reading. Um, Hillary Behrman is a writer and social justice advocate living in Seattle, Washington. Her story, Muskeg, was awarded the 2020 Chris O'Malley Prize in Fiction and published in the Madison Review. Her story, Rocks, was recognized in Glimmer Train's 2018 Top 25 Very Short Fiction Contest and appears in High Desert Journal. She is a 2021 graduate of Pacific University's MFA in Creative Writing Program. Thank you. Okay, um, first, uh, hi, and um, big thank you to Laura, Corey, the staff and editors and board at HDJ um, for creating this gorgeous publication and for including my story. Um, and thanks to the other um, contributing artists and writers, it's really wonderful to be in your company and to have my work paired um, with Sandra Dahl Pagato's arresting and stunning painting. Um, Okay, I'm going to just read the opening scene from my story, The Alboard. The voices know when the dinner rush is over and Viv starts the cleanup. They wait for the lull, swooping in to spew insults. They wait for Roy Howard, the last of the regulars, to finish his third cup of decaf and ease himself out of the brown vinyl booth closest to the door, nodding first toward Viv as she wipes down the counter and then raising a hand to Dale as he scrapes a day's worth of gristle and fat off the grill. By the time Viv has the ketchup bottles wiped, refilled and lined up in three neat rows, looking like a full box of red Crayola crayons, they come clamoring down, zinging out of the electrical sockets and buzzing around the fluorescent light fixtures bolted to the ceiling of the small cafe, separating and reforming as reforming as they extricate themselves from the backup generator, industrial freezer, and hydraulic lift in the adjacent garage. They debate, they revisit grudges, they never know when to shut up. If Viv moves fast, she will be in her car before she has the chance to hear what they're going on about. She will be long gone before, they, before she starts talking back. She never tells Dale about the voices, or at least not in so many words but he accepts her urgency and never asks her to stay late and help close up. Each night, he makes the same offer. Go on, Viv, I'll, I'll lock up tonight. As if each time the idea has just come to him. Dale is not a big man, but Viv thinks he isn't exactly small either. He carries most of his weight in his barrel chest and his thick upper arms. He works as hard as Viv does, and he has a daughter somewhere near Boise who he'd like to see more of. Viv has tried not to listen when he calls the girl from the phone that hangs on the narrow strip of exposed drywall between the industrial freezer and the square metal sinks in the cafe's cramped kitchen. More often than not, his daughter doesn't answer and he just leaves a message. Tonight, Viv makes it to her car just as the outside lights click on, flooding the gravel around the gas pumps, making bits of mica sparkle like the night sky crushed underfoot. She is almost too late. A tight band of pressure wraps around her chest and meets in two hot fists in the middle of her back. Once she's in the car, her hands are shaking so hard she can't manage to jam the key into the ignition and drops it to the floor. She doesn't pick it up, reaching instead for the door lock and slamming her right hand down hard on the button. The protective bulb of plastic is missing and she stabs her palm on the raw metal post. The pain focuses her. Her breath steadies and she carefully reaches from door to door and pushes down the rest of the locks before she retrieves her keys from the floor and starts the car. She pulls away from the field station, cafe, gas, garage, motel, all in one. The place constitutes most of the entire town of fields. She floats her foot on the pedal, resists the urge to gun it. The car is baked from sitting in the sun all day behind the cabins, but she can't unroll the windows to let the night air in, not yet. 
not until she is free and clear of fields and the half dozen electrical and telephone poles that populate the place. The voices have done it before, jumping from the wires into the transmission of her car. She doesn't want to take the chance. Her slick nylon work blouse, a fake 1950s bowling shirt with a cursive V above her right boob is sweat soaked and her rope thick braid of black and gray hair sticks to the wet at the base of her neck. During the day, Liv has ways of managing their buzz, but at night only the desert will do. The Alvord, not really a desert at all, is 84 square miles of hard baked mud. It stretches out from under the basalt ruffles of the eastern slope of Steens Mountain. Not another soul in sight, no telephone poles, transmission towers, nothing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hillary. That was wonderful. Um, so next up, we have Lori Frisbee. Lori is a poet and artist based in Denver. Denver. She grew up in Bozeman, Montana, before it became a getaway for the rich and famous. She is fascinated with the quiet conflicts that gentrification has brought to her hometown and with the moments that have passed into cultural obsolescence, whether it's drive-in movie theaters or old cowboy bars. To see some more of her work, visit LoriFrisbee.com. Hi all, I wanna thank you guys for having me. This is such a beautiful, beautiful journal and the work is astounding. Thank you so much. Um, so I am a kid from the seventies. So Bozeman used to be a little bit more rough around the edges than it currently is for those of you guys that have been to Bozeman recently. So here's my poem, College National Finals Rodeo. So college national finals rodeo, raised outside in the shadow of the mountains. I weeded the garden, snacked on sweet peas and rhubarb while my father, a history major, cooked short order at the Holiday Inn, a quiet life and languid. Of all the tiny towns in the middle of nowhere, mine was always just a little more intellectual, a little more affordable an escape for the humbly educated, the people willing to make less to live more. But every summer, the college national finals came to town. That week long embarrassment of rodeo queens, bull riders and calf ropers, redneck royalty in their shiny new pickups, pulling airbrushed horse trailers, the enormous belt buckles, the boots that cost more than a month's it. rent. I got it. Okay. Thanks. Hey, I just saw I was down in another resident's room and they played your thing on uh, Channel 8 News again. Okay. Tonight. It Good. was on when I was down there, like at uh, okay. 4.35 o'clock. So I don't know what's happening here. So if you're, if you're not reading, just make sure that your, your computer's on mute so that we can hear the person reading. Sorry. You're okay. These things happen. I yeah. yeah. <laughs> Zoom calls oh, can be, gonna be one snafu. Pick up wherever you want, Lori. Oh, okay. Um, so the enormous belt buckles, the boost boots that cost more than a month's rent. Who could forget the barrel racer from Casper? Her hair groomed until it was plastic. She rode with a whip beneath her teeth. And how drunk one night. She crashed her trunk truck into a cottonwood tree, driving back from shooting signs on a country road. The Chronicle ran her story as one of daring young talent cut short. But on Friday night, the rock and R was filled beyond capacity. Its carpet so soaked with dollar beers, it was like two stepping on a sponge. A week when women, a week when women and men were slept with, fought over, all hotel rooms trashed, all rivals defeated. It was a carnival we put on for people from other places, living out their fantasy of the West. How we spent the next days cleaning up after them, counting the meager tips, vacuuming errant rhinestones from under motel beds. Thanks, you guys. Hey, thank you so much, Lori. Lori, I'm from a small town in Wyoming, and all I ever wanted to be was a barrel racer from Casper. <laughs> oh, absolutely. They're beautiful. <laughs> I really, I really enjoyed you. Magnificent. So much. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. 
All right. Uh, Tally Kaiser teaches college courses that combine literary study with outdoor expeditions. She is among the very few women who have completed the Sierra High Route solo. Woohoo! It matters to her that John Muir actually wrote John Muir Muir, excuse me, actually wrote the mountains are calling and I must go and I will work on while I can studying incessantly. You don't usually hear the full quote. Tally's work has been published in Hawk and Handsaw, The Hopper, Creek Journals, and Fourth River. You can find more of her work at tallyvkaiser.com. Thank you so much, Stacy. And I have to say, uh, Corey's work, this poem is the shape uh, that it is because of his just wonderful attention to it as an editor. Uh, and I love how he managed my um, demands for white space on the page in the, uh, the publication. So thank you, especially to Corey for your hard work. Um, I do want to note that the poem I'm about to read quotes from a 1911 text that includes some outdated terms for native communities and also some images of violence against indigenous people. Uh, and it also has some information about contemporary legal injustice against native communities. Uh, I find it impossible to read without some level of bite or sarcasm. If any of that isn't for you, uh, please take care of yourself. Mute me, exit as you see fit. This is entitled A Series of Discoveries. It opens with a quote from Natalie Diaz's post-colonial uh, post love poem. What does it mean that your life is made of someone else's shed water and blood? In 2007, I discovered Yosemite. No. Discovered mountains? No. Discovered my body? Mountains discovered my body to me. Discovery, uncovery, I learned there is muscle in me and movement. What was latent and slack and unwilling learned granite and light for hundreds of miles on foot all summer. And even among the trash and traffic of the valley, and even after the work days, numb at a register, dumb cash thumbed through my hands, I walked back to camp, the late moon on the cliffs, the late moon on the water streaming from the cliffs in such great quiet. And I thought I had found my country. In 1851, Yosemite Valley was discovered by the Mariposa Battalion, a, voluntary, a volunteer military force, armed miners, armed farmers. A punitive expedition, a punitive expedition, a punitive expedition against the local Indians. In 1851, a punitive expedition proposed the name Yosemite, suggestive, euphonious, certainly American, the name of the tribe of Indians leaving their homes in this valley, endeavoring to escape our charitable intentions. To paradox truth, hold a pen. Etymology, pen from penna, Latin for feather, for wing. Upon this wing, my people fly from history into history, wielding clear, clean lines and numbers, such as Yosemite Valley was discovered and first entered by 58 members of the Mariposa Battalion. Passive, so exact, as if there once was a valley waiting spread wide and she always did like the look of a man in uniform. Note, I am a woman. I write with a pencil. Etymology, pencil from Latin paniculus, diminutive of penis. Oof. Lead and a barrel built to fit the hand and the power of erasure. I too must wield this violence, this blurring, this blurred. In 1851, we had not the time to hunt them. It was therefore decided to destroy their huts and stores, starving them out. Though generations had entered the valley, 
though generations had lived in it, though it had the name Awani and its people were Awanichi, my people discovered Yosemite. My people named it Yosemite. The name was decided by vote, America, of drunken white men round a campfire, America. But the name of Awani endured as the name of a luxury hotel, famed for its Mayan revival decor and its splendid dining room, where I labored as an employee in the summer of 2007, where I learned to hold my hand over my heart when resolving conflicts, such as qualms with cold eggs or a lack of available tables. My manager said, a hand over the heart is a cross-cultural signal of apology. In 1851, the leader of the Mariposa Battalion, one Major Savage, translated Yosemite as full-grown grizzly bear. This remained the accepted translation for over a century and was wrong. Etymology, Yosemite, from yos to kill with the modifier e, one who, and the suffix medi, plural, Yosemite means those who kill. It's those who kill, National Park. In 1864, Abraham Lincoln signs the papers that first conserve Yosemite, where Awanichi residents perform as live tourist displays. In 1969, that's 105 years, residents removed, homes burned as part of a firefighter's training exercise. In 1982, descendants first file a petition seeking formal acknowledgement as a federally recognized tribe. In November 2018, that's 36 years. The evidence submitted insufficient. 25 CFR 83.7b requires, comprises a distinct community and has existed as a community from historical times until the present. The failure to meet criteria requires determination. The petitioning group is not an Indian tribe within the meaning of federal law, a punitive expedition. By our laws, you did not endure intact enough to exist. And here I have found my country. Here is what my people teach. To own a place, walk in and name it. Hold your hand over your heart, but hold that pen tighter. My love for these mountains walks alive in history and hungry. And I can wield this lead and this barrel fit to my hand, but where does it, where do I point? Thank you. Thank you so much, Tally. That was a wonderful reading. Just a reminder to the readers to check the comments and read all the wonderful things people are saying about you. <laughs> uh, Camille Mader is a literature scholar with an emphasis in modernism and an editor of Women's Studies and interdi Interdisciplinary Journal. Before moving to California to pursue a PhD in English at Claremont Graduate University, Claremont, excuse me, Graduate University, Camille lived in Texas, New York, where she obtained a BA in liberal arts from Sarah Lawrence Col College and an MAT from Bard College and Colorado. Camille currently resides in the Southern California desert and is an equestrian and a rock climber. Welcome, Camille. Thank you so much. It is so wonderful to be here. And I'm so grateful to you all for organizing this. And I'm also so grateful for the opportunity to be in this beautiful journal. Um, and of course, to Laura for her very helpful feedback, helping me create this piece, which is my first published piece. Um, so I'll be reading from the start of my short story, Groundwater. Groundwater. The cinder block cabin was on a wide sand road past five miles of Jupiter and yucca that speared perforated grocery bags that ripped through the Mojave like tumbleweeds when the wind blew. James drove me to see the house in the time of year when wildflowers and chia bloomed vibrant in the depressions where soon they die when summer came. That day, I met him at his place nearby after my long journey from the city and he took the wheel. When we went somewhere together, he always drove, but it was always my car, never his. His work truck was a sacred thing and he made clear it wasn't for me. While I walked through the bright kitchen and dark bedroom with my potential landlord, Sal, James eyed the threshold as if it were a rattlesnake and waited outside. This was supposed to be our place. 
Sal was in his 60s, walked with a slight limp and had a leg that bowed out like he was making a circle with his foot on the carpet. He was laconic, grunted with distaste when I said I was working on a PhD in literature. I changed the subject. What did it matter? Drove down Highway 66 to get here, east from the Los Angeles lights, east through the desert, halfway to Nevada, like a Kerouac who had to go somewhere but was afraid to go anywhere. Here was where I would write my dissertation, an obscure topic no one would ever care about. And maybe, just maybe, one day it would be published, printed on cheap, thin paper no one would ever read. While Sal told me the rent price, I looked out the kitchen window above the white ceramic sink. There were no plants in the backyard, only miles of sand and the rusted tank of a well biting thousands of deep into the earth to suck what was left of the Southern California watershed so I could scrub clean my fleshy writer's body. I took the house while James waited outside. I was moving a hundred miles from school on a promise of living together once I was settled in. But I also knew that this wouldn't come true. After the lease had been signed, James entered through the doorway, came into the kitchen, caressing me from behind at the kitchen window while Sal drove away in his pickup. You look so beautiful in the desert, he whispered breathlessly, putting his hand into my jeans. I felt myself become fluid under the coarseness of his hand, moaned as he pushed me up against the sink. It was performative. My mind was flying elsewhere like a crow above the landscape, but I let him slip in and out of me while I leaned on my hands and fixed my gaze on the cracked white paint and corroding metal of the pump house. Behind it, the land dipped down in a sandy wash twisted past hair-like brush that swayed darkly. His hands were leathered, a rancher's hands. He was a vet, a horse vet. The years he had spent working in the sun had hardened him. Out here, people didn't call for frivolities the way they did at the sport horse barns in the suburbs. Horses here were working horses. When someone called him, it was life and death, birth, euthanasia. The timing was different too. There was no, let's plan something, schedule Thursday, see what you think. When you made the call, it was time. The hands that caressed me now had touched hooves, dirt, blood, amniotic fluid. Dying souls, birthed foals, struggling free of the calls in their mother's bellies. When he had finished, he looked out the window. He had come inside me. I could feel it spilling out. By the way, he murmured, I wouldn't drink the water. Before I was born, he said, there was a landfill not too far up the dirt road, filled in. He remembered. He had lived nearby then. The water that flowed from the faucet smelled pure, but there was no knowing what traces it carried with it. Last winter, move in with me, he murmured while his hand kneaded the small of my back. I giggled. Here? His hand clenched, tense. No, he said into my neck. I've been here too long. It would be too weird. We'll get our own place. The smell of age was in the earth walls of his desert home, like the sand had risen up into the air. The taste of sweat and skin in the bedroom. He was right. There had been too much time here, past lovers, past memories. Outside, a December wind called a familiar sound, like a, like a word almost remembered. Will you look with me? I asked. Yes, he said, his lips on mine. He never let me stay with him more than one night in a row deep in that place inside us that always knows, I knew. Thank you all so much. I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much, Camille. That was beautiful. Like a word almost remembered. I love that. Thank you. Um, and just so everyone knows, our uh, creative director, Corey, is posting the link to these pieces as they're being read. So if you are someone that likes to read along, um, it's real easy to just click on the link Corey's posting and you can read along with the reader. Uh, Zach Ostroff received his MFA in creative writing from the Inland Northwest Center for Writers at Eastern Washington University, 2016. His work has been published in Hippocampus Magazine and Essay, a Journal of Nonfiction Studies. He has also exhibited book art projects at a variety of venues. When he isn't writing, he likes to spend time with his family. He is currently a PhD student in creative writing at Texas Tech University. Welcome, Zach. Thank you. I think everybody so far has said how grateful they are. And I would just add my voice to that. This is really a wonderful issue and I'm thankful to be part of it. So this is my piece, Bread for Birds. Thinking back, I can see the sky filled with birds. 
birds swirling on the uplift, birds plummeting downwards like arrows, birds with wings outstretched to glide in place. Mostly seagulls, these birds cawed and called and raced towards chunks of bread held out by the man. He'd come once or twice a week, drooped low, bent with age. The man would come no matter the season. In the cold, he'd come bundled in a jacket and a Cossack hat, braced against the wind. In the warmer months, he'd wear a plaid shirt tucked into his maroon pants that sagged so much that it was only the tuck of the shirt, not the belt, that kept the pants up. Walking across the street from his house to the field of long grass, he would open a bag of bread and call out like he was a bird. Kya, kya. Soon one bird would come, then another, then another. Pretty soon, the once empty sky was filled with seagulls that would funnel to the man, grab the offered bread from his outstretched hand and launch back into the air. If you were close enough to see the man's face, you would see stars flecked and shining within his blue-green eyes. His eyes didn't always shine like this. Still, they did when he fed the birds, when he'd tell a joke to his grandchildren, or whenever he could surprise someone by sharing a bit of everyday magic. The cloud of gulls created a vortex of sound and feather that cycled down, each bird taking its turn, dropping low and raising up, dropping low and raising up. And each time a bird swooped down from the sky to a light but not really land, a hovering between down and up, caused by a sudden flap of wings so it could reach the bread in the hand, the man's eyes grew a little brighter. Piece after piece of bread was freely proffered, and then there was none. No more bread. The old man would then walk back across the street, up a cement driveway cracked by the encroaching lawn, and into his garage. As the door closed behind him with a rattle and a bump, the birds would dissipate, returning the sky to blue, as if they'd never been there. Not at all. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Zach. That was so lovely. I found your piece um, so sort of tender and sad in the way that I love when writing is tender and sad. Really well done. It's very beautiful reading. Thank you. Uh, Suzanne Straza has been writing from the West for over 30 years. She has been a journalist and a regular columnist for Four Corners Free Press and Inside Outside Magazine. She has appeared in many publications, including Paddler Magazine, Mountain Gazette, and the recently published collection Wet, an anthology of water poems and prose from the high desert and mountains of the Four Corners region. She was a participant in the Raven Narratives, a live storytelling event, and was awarded an artist in residency through San Juan National Forest. She has found home in a remote canyon in southwestern Colorado. Welcome, Suzanne. Thank you. Um, and Yes, I am thrilled and grateful. And really, as I'm sitting here listening to everybody, I'm so honored to be included in this group of amazingly talented artists. So thank you. Um, and just to preface this a little bit, my essay was is written in sort of little chunks. And instead of reading something straight through, I've taken some of these chunks and lined them up. Um, the background to this is that in my non-writing life, I work for an organization and we investigate wrongful conviction claims by uh, prison inmates around the country, primarily people convicted of murder. And um, this story is about going to visit one of my inmates in Colorado Springs, so about six hours away. Early this morning, I shut my front door and drove east. In the first 11 miles, I saw no other vehicles. On my right, the sacred mountain of the Ute Mountain Ute tribe towered over me. On my left, a national monument. I can walk 20 miles north or south and the only traces of humanity I will encounter are crumbling walls of 800 year old homes tucked into the red rock cliffs. There is enough emptiness to embrace the inner workings of my mind and my soul. When my world seems too small, my burdens too heavy, I have a place to scatter the unpleasantness and revive my sense of well being, clear my mind, chase the squirrels from the attic. I am nervous about this visit. When I mention this to my boss, she assures me that prisons are one of the safest places around if you're a visitor. That's not what makes me nervous. What I fear is having my heart broken. 
I am afraid that I will see something so terrible, so inhumane that it will crush me. I will be utterly self-conscious about my privilege. Due to COVID, prisons canceled all visits for inmates, allowing no connections with the outside world. My clients told me that survival was their sole focus. Terror of an agonizing, lonely death spread faster than the virus. Pleas for our help became more insistent. The worst part, inmates were no longer allowed to go outside. Quarantine meant only breathing air that had already been used by someone else. While the pandemic allowed me the opportunity to slow down, take long hikes, and get my hands dirty in my garden, it provided a death sentence for prison inmates. As I melded into the landscape, Javier melded into the concrete blocks of his cell. During one conversation, a client, Dre, inquires, how was your weekend? I tell him that I went rafting on the Dolores River. He questions, what's river rafting? I send him a photo of my son rowing in Utah. The next time we talk, he hesitatingly asks, if I ever get out of here, will you take me rafting? My heart squeezes and tears flood my vision. I would love to. Eight of my nine current clients are men, men of color, erroneously convicted of crimes of poverty, robbery, drugs, murder. The pain and confusion in their voices is enough to dismantle me. I get off the phone and lie down in the creek behind my house, letting the sweet water wash me free of the world's injustice. I imagine my blue raft floating down the clean, clear river loaded with a handful of 240 pound middle-aged black men in life vests that barely fit over their muscled chests. Shaved heads, tattoos creeping up necks, battle scars surrounding the smile on their faces. I have seen their mug shots. I know I am not wrong. Most of them look like they could kill someone with their bare hands. The morning of my visit with Javier, I head south from my son's at 6 a.m. Siri guides me through highway traffic, leading me closer to my destination. She advises me to stay in the lane second from the left, but does not tell me what to expect when I arrive. I tell Siri that I am nervous. She says it seems like I need a friendly person to talk to. Who should she call? My visit is no contact, so we will have a private room with bulletproof glass and telephones on the wall. It is clean. It feels civilized. I see sunlight coming through the door that Javier uses. I think it's not so bad. I'm even a bit let down that I will have no tales of near death to share. And that's when a man with translucent skin walks in and picks up the phone. Skin completely devoid of vitamin D. It gives me the willies at first. Then I fill with pity. I'm a bit embarrassed by my sun ravaged Italian skin. How long has it been since he lay in the grass with the sun shining on his face? This is what I feared, a shattered heart. I vow that I will take Javier down the river. I wonder, will the sky seem overwhelmingly big? The air too clear? Will it be too quiet without shouting and clanging and the sound of cages being locked? Will the silence be terrifying? How do I reconcile the discrepancy between my client's fate and my privilege? How do I find joy when I am so acutely aware of such injustice? It is unfair that I am on the winning side of this juxtaposition between Javier's life and my own. If he was guilty, I might placate my unease with judgments about life choices. Even so, wouldn't he deserve to breathe? Perhaps a little sunshine would make him a better person. I feel the crushing weight of responsibility. It is daunting to be someone's last chance, their last hope. I cannot balance the imbalance. My discomfort does not alleviate Javier's pain. Thank you. Wow, Suzanne, that was so beautiful. How do we find joy when we're so acutely aware of injustice? What an important question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, our next reader is actually one of our visual artists. We shared three of Frances Stilwell's paintings in issue 33. And Corey will post the link to Frances's um, artwork so that you can look at it while she's speaking. 
Uh, Francis Stilwell was born an artist, though for several years struggled to become a scientist. I love that. Her birthplace in 1940 was Cincinnati, Ohio. After one year at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts, she received two degrees in botany and botany biophysics at the University of Cincinnati. She left Ohio in 1969, seeking adventure in Oregon and the, be and the beautiful Pacific Northwest. Here, she was able to combine the best part of her worlds of science and art when working on books and exhibitions. And from January 14th through May 1st of 2022, the 81 artworks featured in her book, Oregon's Botanical Landscape, will be exhibited at the Oregon Historical Society Museum in Portland, Oregon, where the paintings are permanently archived. And you can find that link under Francis's work in, our, um, in this issue of High Desert Journal. So Francis, you just wanna make sure you're unmuted here when you start talking and then we're ready to hear what you have to say. Wonderful. Okay. Well, you, you took away my first paragraph, but, but I appreciate it. <laughs> I was going to start out by saying, before I do my reading, I wanna invite you to come to my exhibition at the Benton, at the, Oregon Historical Society. Well, now they'll hear it twice and no one will forget that they can come see her. <laughs> they did a beautiful job of it. It doesn't look just look like an art show. It looks like something uh, historical, informative um, presentation for people. So, but I'll go right in to reading the text for Wild Rye, Higher Than a Man's Stirrups. Down in the hollow of a dry creek bed, one October evening, I painted wild rye grass growing free on the bank's edge. The rancher, Jeannie Carver of the Imperial Stock Ranch, you may know her, proud of her great basin wild rye, said it used to grow in thick stands and could still reach higher than a man's stirrups. Rich Rick Miller, retired Oregon State University range ecologist, told me lightning fires decreased temporarily in the 1870s after the reduction of flammable grass by so many cows and sheep grazing. Then when Eurasian cheatgrass became prevalent, fires increased again. Miller says, I have learned over my career, the more you know about an ecosystem, the more complicated it gets. The more you realize what you don't know, the more humble you get. A successful approach that he recommends to combat cheatgrass is seeding with bunch grass immediately after a burn. Bunch, grad choice, bunch grass excuse me, choices include great basin wild rye and deep soil and blue bunch wheatgrass or the introduced non-native crested wheatgrass in shallow and native bunch grass in, in shallow soil. Native bunch grass, however, is sometimes hard to come by. That's the end of that entry. At the bottom of each page, I have a map showing the distribution of the plant that I'm talking about. But now since you took my first paragraph, I will go and read another one because it's short. And this is called Running Free in the High Hills and it's from the west side. Um, this painting began as cucumber vines on a hillside meadow in Dunn Forest, north of Corvallis. While working on it, I thought to myself, those don't look like vines, they look like hills for running. But I persevered. When I showed the painting to three friends, each privately said, those don't look like vines, they look like hills for running. In spite of my brain saying paint vines, what was coming out of my hands was my heart yearning for a place for me to run. So I gave up and made it that way. A photo from the Corvallis Gazette Times showing a cross country runner provided the posture for the figure running free across the hills. And I consider her an Indian maiden since this, the whole collection is supposed to mimic uh, the, the landscape before the coming of white men. I realized with this early painting that in all my artwork, contributions by my heart are far more important than those of only my eyes and brain. Therefore, for me, this is the most important painting in this whole collection. So I thank you. It was kind of 
Thank you so much, Francis. That's really joyful to hear where those paintings were birthed and what you were thinking. I love the line, my heart yearning for a place to run. That's really beautiful. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Leith Tonino is a freelance writer living in Colorado. He's the author of two essay collections about the outdoors. Most recently, The West Will Swallow You, which Leith, I have to tell you, I'm really jealous of that title. That's a really great title. Um, and his work appears regularly in Orion, The Sun, High Country News, Adventure Journal, and Outside. And just make sure if you're not reading that your microphone is muted so we can hear Leith read his piece. Thank you. Nice to see you all, hear you all. Um, thanks for being here. Thanks for writing. Thanks for reading. Uh, this is a little short piece of fiction that I can do the whole thing in five minutes. Uh, it's voice driven. It's all voice. So you may or may not be able to follow it that the voice may make it less clear, maybe more clear. I really don't know. It's called Dipper. I went out to the creek the other night, been doing that lately. Not sure why. Didn't even think to ask until just now as I begin writing this thing out. And I was sitting there with my butt to the blue stones, not thinking much, just sitting, thinking, but not really thinking. Mostly just like looking at stuff at the water and spruce and the mountain horizon west, looking and thinking only the smallest bit, largely just staring. And then sure thing, next thing I know, it's basically got dark all around me, night set in. Well, okay, it was Friday night. This was last Friday night. That's why I could afford to let go of time like that and really just let go, like lose track of the track or whatever, and just be out there all of a sudden looking up and around at stars, constellations, and yeah, I guess there were bats scooting around. I remember seeing them too, kind of thinking bats without fully thinking it. You know, it was weird, but also not weird to come to like that and realize, hey, it's about time to head home to have it sneak up on me like that. Because I've been spending more and more time out there, but to the stony beach, eyes on everything and nothing, thoughts hardly anywhere at all. I've been doing that a lot. And no, I haven't gone off quite like that and just sort of woken up to the darkness, but still things like that happen out there sometimes. So it wasn't all that surprising, it wasn't all that weird. Mostly, really, I was just enjoying myself because the stars were dang, just so many, dang. It was nice to be in their company. That's how it felt. That's what I was enjoying. Like the stars were buddies, like old high school friends, that kind of feeling. Like they're here even though they're far away. That's what it was like. That's not what it was like, but I don't know what else to call it. Like friends, something. Anyway, okay, it was getting late, not late late, only maybe nine, but late enough, and I was telling myself, hey, call it good, head home, come back tomorrow. But it was tough because the cool valley air had gone down to the darkness and was sitting right where I was sitting. And so I didn't really want to move because there was that warm pocket of air in my clothes so long as I didn't move. It was that kind of thing where you realize you're cold only once you budge. So I just didn't budge, even though it was time to go. I sat there another hour, who knows how long, just me and my starry pals just hanging out, it being Friday and all. And that's when I think maybe I first noticed it, just around then. The dipper was big in the low west, like upside down on the mountain, like dumping out on the horizon. And I had been looking at it for a long time without even realizing, doing the old not all there stare, and it was pretty much the moment I realized I was looking and had been for some time. It was right then, like a second coming awake moment, first the nighttime having fallen all around me. And now this hunch that something was off. To be specific, I think the last star in the handle of the dipper was off, as in like gone. That's what I thought at least, or maybe felt, maybe both. And so I tried to count. But you know how it is with the dang dipper. It's all confused, or for me it is. You count out from the corner of the pot, or is it the handle only? What makes up the handle? Is the corner star part of the handle? I thought it was four. That's the image I saw in my mind, trying to remember what it actually looks like, see it, then count it in my mind. Four is what I was seeing. Whether that includes the corner star, I don't know. 
That's not the point. The point is that I knew at first for certain that it was off, then second guessed myself, still just sitting on the stones, but now aware that I was looking, totally awake to where I was, and even awake at the tiniest hair on my neck level that the faintest wind was starting up, but I couldn't hear it because the creek was burbling in my ears. And thinking, now I was definitely thinking too, just one thought, but a pretty big one, and I was aware that I was thinking it. I second guessed, but as I did, at the same time, I was still remembering the first feeling, the feeling of being certain. That dipper I could see inside, the remembered one, it was what it was, and I didn't make it up or put it there. It was the one there when I went looking for it. And however many stars it had in its handle, they weren't as few as the stars in the dipper in front of me, dumping out its cup of darkness onto the mountain. It was black now. The mountain was black, blacker than the sky. Okay, so that's that, my little story. Sort of weird, but again, maybe not weird at all. Who am I to say? Still, I can't quite shake it, can't quite get it straight. Whether it was me or the stars, whether everything was normal and same as ever, or whether everything had slightly changed and something was lost. And like I say, I don't even know why I've been spending so much time out alone by the creek. I just have, because I like it, I guess. Because where else would I go? Oh, wonderful. Oh, I love that. I love the ending so much. Oh, it's beautiful. Thank you so much, Leif. You have a lot of comments you should read in the chat. Um, and we are now at our last reader. Emily Withnall is a writer and editor whose work has appeared in Al Jazeera, Gay Magazine, Orion Magazine, Tin House, The Kenyan Review, River Chief, The Indiana Review, Fourth River, The Rumpus, and Ms. Magazine, among, among others. She is a recipient of the AWP Kurt Brown Award in Creative Nonfiction, a John Anson Kittredge Foundation grant, and she has received fellowships from Fish Trap Summer Workshop and Under the Volcano. Emily currently serves as a fellow for Community Change, and she is at work on a book about domestic violence and hydraulic fracturing. Her work can be read at emilywithnall.com. Emily lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico with her two teens. And I just wanna brag a little bit and say also that Emily is my friend. <laughs> thank you, Emily, welcome. Thank you, Stacy, And thank you for being an amazing moderator. And um, I'm so honored to be in this issue with everyone else. Um, the reading has been incredible. Um, hoping I can end it <laughs> okay. And thank you to C. Marie. Um, I think we've been talking for a couple of years about me submitting something. Um, and so I think maybe I was waiting to be a part of this issue. <laughs> so thank you, C. Marie. Um, and also thank you to Corey. I, I had a small typo in um, my piece when it went up um, and he is super fast with getting things done. Just like right away it happened. So thank you. <laughs> um, so I have a kind of fragmented essay as well. Um, and I've chosen like about two thirds of it um, to fit in the time frame, um, kind of skipping around a little bit. Um, so uh, yeah, I um, grew up in Las Vegas, New Mexico, not to be confused with Las Vegas, Nevada. It's the first Las Vegas, New Mexico is the original Vegas. And I feel like a lot of my writing circles around trying to capture the strange, complicated place that it is. Um, so this is where the cactus grows. Claret cup cacti announce themselves and everything I write. This surprised me at first, but it shouldn't have. I've been pierced more than once by their spines. When in bloom, tiny vermilion bouquets dot the dry ground. They are everything I aspire to be. The spring wind in the Sangre de Cristo mountains was cold and relentless and made everyone cranky. I imagined the cacti on the mountainsides hunkering down, plastic bags whipped through the streets. Madcap tumbleweeds flung themselves across the highway. My room faced the alley. I had heard gunshots and police sirens. West side locos and east side locos claimed different parts of town, dragging top stop signs and buildings with the windows punched out. 
I imagined people with guns running past my window, a gunfight, bullets rocketing into my bedroom, killing me instantly. I imagined what my family would say about me when I was dead. The arroyos were mainly dry, so we walked through them look, looking for signs of life beyond the shapes water had carved into stone and earth, fossils, arrowheads, horny toads. Sometimes in the summer, the Arts Council offered art classes at the Immaculate Conception School. We painted poems along the river walk to cover the graffiti. Graffiti spread like weeds across our poems. On Christmas Eve, we traveled over Holman Hill through Mora and up over US Hill to get to Taos for the Pueblo bonfires and procession to the church. We drank hot cider and stood as close as we could to the fire listening to the heartbeat of the booming drums. Once, I walked through Lincoln Park toward the gazebo that smelled like urine. A low rider slowed on the other side of the park and a gun appeared through the passenger window, aimed at a man on the sidewalk. I froze. The man shouted. Finally, the car revved and sped off. I kept walking towards my friend Aaron's house, heart and mouth, hoping she was home. On 4th of July, we gathered at Carnegie Park to watch the parade. A mariachi band played from one float, flamenco dancers danced in the street, and men dressed like Spanish nobles from old Europe rode by on horses. The yellow flag with red zia fluttered from floats. It was harder to spot an American flag. Sorry, I just zoomed a little too fast. Okay. But purple Doc Martens at Hot Topic in the Linda Vista Mall in Santa Fe, a rainbow seat belt belt too, and so on red lips that read, kiss my patch, which I affixed to the back pocket of my ripped up jeans. Sarah taught me how to steal compacts and mascara at Walmart. You couldn't take the stuff with the raised foamy barcodes, just stuff with regular stickers. She showed me where the cameras were and how to turn my back. I eyed the shoplifting warning signs uneasily when we left. Sarah lived in the Enchanted Hills trailer park. It was way closer to our middle school than my house, so we'd cut behind Walmart and hop through the hole in the fence. She had TV and I didn't. We binged on Little Debbie's snack cakes and Twinkies and watched Saved by the Bell and Smells Like Teen Spirit on MTV. Like the town, our school show choir was stuck decades in the past. We sang Everly Brothers medleys and Grease medleys and did jump turns on wobbly risers playing our jazz hands. Friend group, group consisted of all the people who were too uncool to fit in with the skaters, jocks, ranchers, or nerds. We were the misfits and wannabes. When we were bored, we sneaked through dry culverts with flashlights to avoid anything slimy or dead. We hoisted ourselves up onto windowsills and climbed onto roofs of buildings on the tiny university campus. Sometimes campus security would spot us and put their lights on. We shimmied down the building on the side opposite from where they parked. Then we ran. Sable was tall like me, dyed her hair bright red and hung out with the skaters. Mr. King intercepted my note to her one day in English class. He always read students' notes out loud and he was triumphant when he grabbed mine. He hadn't caught me all year. Seba and I smirked at each other as he unfolded it. We'd written it in code. His face darkened. I'll read it later, he muttered. We saw his payback for making us watch his daughter's toddler's pageant videos. The summer that Selena and Titanic came out, I almost lived at the drive-in. I memorized the lines and the songs. My Heart Will Go On and Comuna Flor became my soundtrack for the summer and for the years that followed. Such tragedy, such romance. Abe Montoya went to my high school, cruising one night the way I often did with my friends. He sped up, police lights came on. Scared, he drove faster. They sprayed bullets at him through the back window. Later, the city named a rec center after him. Sunday was pancake morning. We drizzled maple syrup over stacks of pancakes and listened to powwow music on singing wire. According to legend, Apaches drove Spanish colonizers up the steep mesa not far from town where they died of thirst. The mesa is called Starvation Peak. 
The sky is so blue here that you'd never believe me unless you saw it for yourself. Maybe it's because of how strong the sun is, the light like cactus spines piercing and deep. Thank you. Oh, beautiful, Emily. Thank you so much. That was the perfect way to end our reading. Such tragedy, such romance. I love it. Um, I'm going to get a little bit dramatic and sentimental on you right now, but I feel like if if poets don't get to be dramatic and sentimental, then what's what's the point of being a poet? Um, I'm thinking as I listen to all these readings of um, Mark Doty talks about the tradition of seeking, that writing is really just a tradition of seeking and that we're all longing to put the world into words. And that when we manage in some way or another, whether it's through poetry or through an event like this or through fiction or a story from our own lives, when we manage to put the world into words, it heals some rift inside of us. And I just really feel that tonight, like everyone's shaking their heads. We can't even see all the participants who I know are commenting and feeling the um, just feeling these pieces as something that resonates with within them. So just in celebration of that, of the healing that comes when we collectively put the world into words, I just want to say from that place within me and from High Desert Journal, thank you so much to all of our contributors, to our readers, to our donors. Um, our submissions are open now. You can find the link at highdesertjournal.org for our summer issue. And um, read the rest of the issue, keep in touch. You can follow us on every social media platform. Feel free to keep in touch. We just love all of you so much. And I'm so, so grateful to contributors. I'll hang around for a couple more minutes because I see some more um, comments are coming in and hopefully everyone's getting to read. Thank you all. It's been an honor to work. Just thank you, huge thank you to our editors. You can unmute contributors if you want. Let's just all clap for one another. It's so wonderful to see thank you here. You. It was wonderful. One thing I really miss from in-person readings is hearing all the noises that people make in the audience when they're when something's resonating with them. As if you would know how loud I've been in my living room tonight making noises. So thank you so much, everyone. I feel a little sad signing off because uh, notes are still coming in, but I'm hoping you're all reading and reading these notes to you. I'm going to give it two more minutes while we all read these. And just remember that this will be recorded and um, it'll be up on our website. We'll be happy to share it and um, you can share it with family. You'd think we would just be so sick of Zoom, but once in a while, it's still just really lovely to see everyone <laughs> and to have a reason to get together and celebrate. Oh, wonderful. All right, I'm gonna sign off and say goodbye. Thank you, everyone. We love you. Thank you from High Desert Journal. Thanks for all the hard work that goes into all these words, the art that you've sent us. We're so grateful. And Elizabeth, if you wanna just go ahead and stop the meeting, that would be great. We can just all sit and smile at one another for a while also, that's fine too. <laughs>